Welcome to a Healthy Push Podcast. I'm Shannon Jackson, former anxiety sufferer turned adventure mom and anxiety recovery coach. I struggled with anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia for 15 years. And now I help people to push past the stuff that I used to struggle with. Each week, I'll be sharing real and honest conversations along with actionable and practical steps that you can take to help you push past your anxious thoughts, the symptoms, panic, and fears. Welcome. You're right where you're meant to be. All right, today I have a really special guest that I'm really excited to share with you and just have this conversation with her. And she just shares so much enlightening wisdom and insights and practical and simple things for making some really healthy shifts. So I have Aliza here with me and welcome Aliza to a Healthy Push podcast. Thank you so much, Shannon. That's that's very sweet. I'm always so happy when any of the content that I put out on Instagram resonates with people in a real way. So that's yeah. beautiful. I'm so happy to be here in this conversation. Yeah, awesome. It's so good. It, it it lands like you there's that connection. Like it's just it's so good. So let's just start. Like I know you a little bit obviously from following you from Instagram, but tell me like who are you? What do you do? Yes, absolutely. So my name is Eliza. I'm a therapist um in private practice and we have a private practice that's actually now in New York, New Jersey, California, Florida and Texas. So that's really been amazing and such an such a special journey. Um, and I specialize in treating anxiety and related disorders. So really anything that falls under the anxiety bucket, social anxiety, performance anxiety, OCD, panic disorder, generalized anxiety. In New York City, there's obviously like the whole gamut of anxiety and and plus plus. So that's what I specialize in. But me and the therapist in my practice also treat just day to day life things, relationships, depression, adjustments, um, mood disorders, things like that. So that's me and that's what I do. Yeah, that's amazing. So I want to start with something like a a post that I saw and some words that you shared and it really got me thinking and it just is so dang good. So I just want to see if we can talk about this for a minute. But you said, kind of alluding to the fact that our emotions are telling us things and you shared, you know, anxiety is just fear that's been pushed beneath the surface for too long. And that's why when trying to heal from it, we're not aiming for no more fear. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're aiming to let ourselves feel the entirety of the emotion. And I just thought, dang, that's so good. But like, what does that mean? Like, can we make this simple and break this down to be really helpful? Because it is so helpful. Yeah, I would would love to try. And you can tell me if, if what I'm sharing is like, is breaking it down or is making it more complicated. But I think that one of the biggest misconceptions that people have when they walk into my office is that they need to get rid of fear. And that's what they tell me. I'm anxious and I need to get rid of my anxiety. And then I ask them, why? Like, why do you need to get rid of it? Right. And the answer is always because it's uncomfortable. And therein lies the problem, right? Whenever we experience something as discomfort in the world, our automatic response because our body and our feelings are trying to protect us is you have to avoid discomfort. And that obviously creates a very big problem because life gets uncomfortable. Anytime you push yourself outside of your comfort zone, it's going to be uncomfortable. So if you spend your whole life trying to get rid of fear and get rid of anxiety, you will never be the master of it. And it's just an emotion that's basically saying either there's a real danger, you need to abort mission and get a new mission, Or there is danger because this is unknown territory. You've never done it before. You don't have a guarantee that it will succeed, but that's okay. We're just letting you know that this is scary. And honestly, sometimes anxiety is saying, good for you. Go do the thing. It's just going to be a little hard. And when we learn how to befriend that feeling and know what it's actually saying to us and how to decipher this is a real danger versus this is not, it's just outside of my comfort zone, then we can let it be on our side, so to speak. But that will never happen if you try to get rid of your fear. It will never Mm -hmm. happen. It will turn into anxiety and it will live inside of you forever. But if you learn how to talk to your fear and face it in its entirety, you are going to have a much more magical and expansive life because you no longer will see it as this thing that you have to get rid of. 
So good. I mean, I think, you know, of course, you know my community and most are struggling with panic disorder and agoraphobia. And so a lot of the approach, you know, the sort of coping mechanisms and strategies that people use that aren't entirely effective are get rid of it. Like, I mean, that's why I struggled for so long was because I tried to get rid of it for so long. And of course, those feelings are extremely uncomfortable. And so it's sort of your human reaction to like, get rid of this. Like, this is not okay. I don't want to feel this. And so then of course, before you know it, you found that you've done all of these things and restricted your life and limited your life and really shrunk your world so that you don't feel these feelings. And, you know, something interesting, I think, with panic disorder and agoraphobia, right, is a lot of times it's this perceived danger. It's not really that your brain's giving you this message of like, this is actually bad. This is actually scary. This is actually dangerous. Like, I need you to do something. And I think in general, this is a lot of anxiety too, right? Like Mm -hmm. going into a meeting and you're just like, your heart's pounding and nothing even terrible is going to happen, but you just feel anxious. But I think this is the the hard part, right, for a lot of people with panic disorder and agoraphobia. Like they know there isn't danger. I know like logically, but of course when you're anxious and you're in that state, just it feels so heightened. Everything feels so real and you convince yourself like, no, yeah. there's some actual stuff going on here. Yes. So like – I I love how you said if you can find a way to to befriend it because I think that is so helpful. But like, what do you mean by that? Like, what? Yeah, what? (laughs) We make that actually happen. So yeah, no, that's so fair and so valid. And two hours ago, with somebody who I supervise, who is helping somebody through their panic and agoraphobia right now, and she's like, no matter how many times I say that these symptoms are benign, they're not getting it. And the answer is that logic will speak to your brain, but experience speaks to your emotions. And so you cannot logic your way out of panic and agoraphobia. You have to experience your way out of it. And as I'm sure you have probably learned in your healing journey, the only way to face the fears and to actually let yourself experience them head on is to expose yourself to them. And instead of shying away and be like, danger zone, danger zone, get out, get out, you got to run. You say, hey, now let me try to feel this feeling. Let me feel the panic in my body. Let me feel the urge to go home. Let me feel (laughs) the strong urge to check and just make sure my pupils aren't dilating or that my heart rate is actually okay. And instead of doing all those things to make the anxiety go away, you just let your body feel them and you give yourself a lot of TLC through that experience, but you don't quit. So instead of trying to like logic your way through it, you experience your way through it, but with yourself as like this friend and the supporter going through the hard feelings, not just like feeling panicked when they happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. And when you just said experience speaks to your emotions, I was like, dang, it's so true. Like you just word things so differently, I think, in ways that people don't normally when they approach this stuff, but it just makes so much sense. And like, I think people too, right, get very stuck on the exposure means I have to get in the car, I have to go to the store, I have to do these terrible things that are terrifying that I don't want to do. But really, you know, what you're saying, and I think is a big part of what I teach is it's about actually allowing yourself to feel the feelings. It's not really about getting in the car and driving and and going to the store and doing these things. You know, you can go through the motions, but if you're not actually letting yourself feel and experience, it's kind of all for nothing. It's sort of, you know, this is what I did for years and it felt torturous and I actually was torturing myself through it. So I'm sure you've had like that experience you know, in, in working with clients, it can be really tricky, right? So hard. One of the first exercises that we do before we even start exposures is we, we write a commitment script. I don't know if you've ever heard of this or if you've done this, but we write commitments to the work that we're doing. And in the script we write, this is not about getting in the car. Mm. This is not about the grocery store. This is about my relationship with fear or my relationship with control, or my relationship with feeling out of control, or my relationship with the unknown, right? Like, maybe I'm going to lose my mind. Maybe this time I'm going to die. Let's get comfortable with the unknown. 
let's get comfortable with this idea of control or not having it. And we make sure that people are really committed to like the deep work as they do the exposure so that it's not rote. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I have heard that before and I think it it can be really motivating too and helpful because it is really hard to take the actions. You feel like very hopeless at times and you feel like what is even the point? Like I'm I'm gonna struggle with this continuously and it just it can at times feel like you're not actually making any progress even when you are. Um, But I'm curious, like sort of backtracking a little bit before we get to that point of like, you're, you're doing the thing, you're going to face the fear and more so face the emotions, right? Like, Mm -hmm. why don't we take the steps that we know we need to take? Because I think that's the other part of it too. Like, there's so much we know logically. (laughs) Panic's not dangerous. Like, I have to take these steps and I, and I want my life to look differently. And I want to actually be capable of doing more things, but like, why don't we actually do it? Yeah. It's a great question. And I think it's also related to just, this is about anxiety overall. This is not only about panic, right? It's about anxiety is the emotion that tells us you have to protect yourself. And I think a lot of us walk through this world feeling like we have to protect ourselves. And then if we don't, nobody will. So if we have a signal inside of us that says danger zone, we listen to it and we consider it to be like the mecca of how we should be living, right? It's like, I got to protect myself, have to stay safe, can't let anybody hurt me. It's a dangerous world out there. And however we all got these memos, because a lot of us got these memos as kids and as young adults, and then even into adulthood, we never undid them. And if you never undo the messages that you received when you were younger, you will keep living that way. And I think a lot of people are just automatically living that way. Yeah. I. What are some of the messages do you think? I mean, I'm sure you hear this stuff, but I'm just curious. Like, what do you think some of the messages are that many of us have received and that we need to work on changing? I think a lot of them have to do with, first of all, attachment, right? Mm-hmm. And our parents did the absolute best that they could. And we may have we may have amazing relationships with our parents. And sometimes we still don't get those attachment needs met for better, or for worse, right? Like it doesn't, it's nothing to do with the people that raised us, honestly. It's the way that our attachment systems are wired. So there may have just been like, I needed more emotional TLC as a kid and I didn't get it. So I walked through this world feeling like my emotions are too much or I don't know how to deal with them when they come up. It could be that we got them with, you know, some perfectionism, maybe in grad school or maybe in middle school or maybe in kindergarten when the teacher was like, cut in the lines. And you're like, but I just want to be free, right? And maybe we got messages about perfectionism that have stuck with us. Um, And I think it's also like the world can get kind of scary sometimes, right? And we go through, we go through tragedies, we go through hardships, we go through big T traumas. We go through little T traumas, right, which are just day-to-day life things that may have been pervasive and hurtful for us that nobody nobody really quite taught us how to deal with. And so those are some things that can just kind of live on the inside. And again, similar, similar story. If we don't truly let ourselves feel them and experience everything that came along with them, they get stuck. And the thought processes get stuck, the core beliefs get stuck, but also the emotions and sensations in our bodies get stuck. And those can kind of show up as anxiety and panic too. Yeah. I I think, you know, in thinking about my own journey, right, I grew up and I've been, you know, very honest about this in a in a house with a parent who like had very volatile behaviors and didn't express emotions and the way he navigated his own emotions, right? Like taught me they're too big, they're too scary, and you just react very harshly to them. And so I feel like right. yeah, yeah, or not at all. And I think part of how I sort of maneuvered that. And what I learned was go inward. You don't talk about it. Like yeah. hopefully it'll just go away and yeah. you you try to avoid these feelings as much as possible. Or you try yeah. to like literally fight them and combat them, which yeah. both were severely unhealthy. So, you know, that was part of my journey. I think sometimes it can be hard, right? Because with some people, they'll they'll think and feel strongly about like, I don't want to have to go back to my childhood. Like, I don't think that's part of this. I don't think I have to do that work. And true, you know, for some people, it's not, it, there's not that aspect and it might just not even be helpful or something that you're willing to do and that's okay. 
But for some people, you know, it, we did learn these things very early on and it did have a significant impact. And, you know, for me, I think too, part of that, like I really latched on to control. Like, yeah. however, I cannot feel big, scary emotions. I'm going to do my damnedest to not experience them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think for some people too, you got me thinking, I think some people grew up with parents, right, where everything was dangerous. Like, don't do that. Be careful. Like the world is scary, you know, and all, and how that shapes your perception, right? Whether it's valid or not is so overwhelming to grow up thinking you always have to protect yourself. Yeah. And that, I think that all of this makes it tricky with anxiety, right? Cause it is like this protective mechanism, but you feel like it's entirely working against you because again, right. It's not logical. Like you're, you don't actually have something to protect yourself from. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. And that's where it becomes like the misfirings in your brain, right? That if you're yelling at your brain saying, stop it, just stop being anxious, stop panicking, right? right. That's like horrible because then it ends up getting way worse. And what was like possibly movable ends up becoming so stuck because as long as you fight, it will fight harder. Um, But if you befriend it and you talk to it and you're just like, hey, anxiety, I see you. You're trying Mm -hmm. to send me a memo today. Let me remind you, the world is as safe as it's going to be. I can't guarantee that everything will be fine, but I'm going to go out there and I'm going to live as if the world is safe enough for today because that's how I want to live and that's how I value living. Mm-hmm. And that would be more of a narrative about like befriending your anxiety and talking to it that way instead of like to use your language, either like pushing it down and pretending it doesn't exist or finding all the ways that you can control life so that you don't have to feel that out of control feeling either. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so good. So I think, right, if somebody is like, I, I, I'm, I'm trying, right? I'm trying to do this work and it's really, really hard because I think especially for years, if you have created these habits and they used to be helpful, right, all these coping mechanisms, the way that you approached anxiety and like have been trying to manage it, but now you've recognized it's, like what I've been doing isn't working and like I need to befriend anxiety. I need to do things differently. Like what, is there anything that you can do to make this all less hard? (laughs) Because it is so dang hard. It really is. It really is. I think that when people ask me this question, it's like habits form new thought processes So the more you stick to it and the more you stick to it consistently, the easier it will all start to feel. You will start to feel more empowered. Your anxiety will start to feel more manageable, but it's got to be consistent. Um, So I think there's a lot of power in habit and there's a lot of power in doing either many exposures every day. If you have generalized anxiety to like do many exposures that are related to everyday life, even if nobody else in the universe would find them scary, nobody even has to know. Just do the thing and do it every day for a set amount of time and see how how you feel. And the response ends up being like really powerful. People are like, I didn't realize that doing that every day would make even a bit a bit of a difference, but it does. So I think if people really stick to it in small, manageable, but consistent ways, it will hopefully start to feel a little bit easier. Can you give us an example? I'm just curious in what you just shared. Like what is something that you know, somebody, I know obviously it's individualized for each person and it's going to look differently, but like, what's an example of something that, you know, a a micro thing that you could do every day that's not going to be so overwhelming and seem so big and like scary? For somebody with panic and agoraphobia, you can walk down to the end of your block without your phone every day, the same Mm -hmm. block. Well, I don't know where that is on somebody's like hierarchy of healing, but like for some people, that's like the hardest. And for some people, they're like, that I can do. It's tough. It will push me a little bit, but that I can do. With somebody with social anxiety, I say speak to one stranger every day in the elevator to say, have a good day. Or if you're on the street, just say, do you have the time? Of course, for somebody who's starting out their healing, this might be an extremely overwhelming thing. But once you're once you're already in it and you're just like, okay, I'm in like maintenance phase, like still challenge yourself every day. Do something small. Yeah, I love that. I don't even... I, I wouldn't say I have social anxiety. I would just say I'm very introverted and shy. 
But this is something that I challenge myself to do and it sounds so silly, I know. But like when I go on for my walks, I try to like talk to somebody and I try to like – You know, it's just the simple and it makes me uncomfortable. And it's so like, you know, I'm trying not, I'm trying to be much better about not being like, Shannon, this is so ridiculous. Like, just say hi to the person. Like, this is not that hard. (laughs) But it is for me. And like, and that's okay. But like, challenging myself helps me to get more comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings. And I think that's all like a big piece of this, right? Is like recognizing. I can stay in my comfort zone, sure, but like it's not necessarily safer. It's actually really restricting and not super enjoyable. And right. I don't want to just be stuck here. And so recognizing, right, I, I want to get outside of my comfort zone and and what are small ways in which I could do that? I don't know. And I think for some people, like you'll you'll say, you know, doing or they'll hear, you know, I have to do exposures every day. And they're like, what? Like, there's no way. But I think it, making it more digestible helps. But I also think, like, I think you alluded to consistency doesn't necessarily mean every single day. Like, maybe it doesn't have to look like every single day for somebody. Right. right for sure. It can be two times a week and that's your exposure. Um, or it can be every day something small, but that pushes you out of your comfort zone but in a way that's not torture, right? Like talking to somebody on your walk and it's like making that like a pleasant connective experience. Um, But I also really love that you brought up the self-compassion piece and not judging yourself for the exposures on your list. I challenged myself to do this at one point, um, probably like last year or two years ago. And I'm like, if people would see the things on my list, they would be like, (laughs) not only are you a little crazy, but you are not a therapist. And I'm like, (laughs) What? That's fine. Nobody ever has to see my list. I don't think anybody's ever seen my full list either. I have <laughs> like little ones to some people. Like, look what I did today. But it doesn't matter. And it can be as small and tiny as it needs to be. Nobody needs to know. They can know. But it's about like having that self-compassion for yourself and saying, I'm so proud that you did the thing. I'm so proud that you did the hard thing. Because um, that's building mastery, right? And doing that with that self-compassion voice is like – it's fuel for you. It will keep you going and it will keep you wanting to do it. Yeah, so true. And it's so underestimated. I know I underestimated it for so long. And now, of course, in hindsight, I kick myself because I'm like, what the heck were you doing? Like, if you were just so much more compassionate with yourself, it would have been so much easier and also more motivating. Yeah. And just being supportive of yourself goes such a long way. Um But yeah, don't worry, guys. We'll put up Elise's list so you can all see it. (laughs) (laughs) But I I love how you shared that, though, because I think, you know, we do obviously judge ourselves and we are so, we are our worst critics and we judge ourselves so harshly. And it's like, you know, we think a lot of times with panic disorder and agoraphobia, everyone's judging us. Everyone knows. Everyone thinks that we're crazy. And it's yep. internally, like how we're thinking and the messaging that's going on, like how we're talking to ourselves. And it's really, you know, looking at that instead of how can I change my perception of what other people are thinking or what what they might be feeling? Because that, that doesn't actually matter. That holds no weight. But for you, like that's that's massive. So, yeah. you know, you shared something where you said you can either view fear as something that stops you from living or as something that points you to the exact place where your greatest potential lies. Yes. And I thought that that was so cool because it's using fear, right, as a motivator. And I'm just curious, like, can we talk about this? Like, how can you actually use the fear and this discomfort to help propel you forward because I think, especially for me, just speaking for myself, it was a huge piece for me that helped me to start making a ton of progress. Yeah. No, I. that's one of my favorite concepts and I think it's really hard for people to understand. It was so hard for me to understand for a really big part of my life too. If, if we understand fear as like a messaging system, any emotion is just a messaging system, right? They're not out of the blue. There there are interpretations of a life that's actually happening around us. Fear is no different, right? And when we think about what is fear actually saying, 
like I said earlier, it's either like a, a legit danger that you have to fix. So fix it if it is. But if it's not, it means that you are stepping out of a boundary that you previously had. Anytime we do something different, it will feel scary because it's totally unknown. But you cannot grow within your comfort zone. You can't grow if you're not willing to face the unknown. You can't grow if there's not a risk that maybe you won't actually make it. That's not growth. That's just doing what you're doing. So when you start to look at that and you're like, oh, fear is cropping up here. Oh, fear is cropping up there. Anxiety is cropping up there. They're almost like these little lampposts that are saying, oh, there's a border in your comfort zone. Go that way. Go that direction. It's going to get you to the other side. And when you start looking at them, people look at them as like these like danger zone, right? Danger, like signs, like run. But really it's not. It's a little tiny lamp that's saying, here's the border of your comfort zone. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, if you cross this one, you're going to be in a whole new terrain. So just do it. Do the thing. Cross it. And when we start looking at fear like that, like tiny little points, and we get ourselves to the other side, everything is everything is just set out for us. It's perfect. Yeah. I, I love it. I love that you said that because I think – so many people that I've worked with, right, they tell me, we, we start digging in and we start uncovering, like, what are the things, like, that you really fear? And for me, right on the other side, I'm like, oh, this is awesome because these this is, like, helping us to create, like, this path. But, of course, when you're in it and you're struggling so deeply, you're like, no, those are, the, like – you need to teach me how to figure out like how to get rid of these things and then I'll live. And it's like, yep. no, like, unfortunately, right. That would be nice because as humans, like we all want to feel comfortable at all times. Yep. But unfortunately, like you said, that growth doesn't happen. And so it's like these, these things that you're really fearing and that you're talking about a lot. And, you know, the more we dig into things, it's like you're uncovering these things that are also massively important to you, these things that you massively value. And it's like, like you said, that messaging of like, this is important and we need to work, you know, with this fear and do it in a way that feels manageable, of course, but this is actually going to get you to that other side of what, whatever it is that you're looking for. You know, I, it was the weirdest thing when I was working to recover, I got into hiking and just so many aspects of that. Like you're telling me to go hike, be out in the middle of nowhere, not have cell service, not be close to quote safety. Wow. Like what? But right. I just had this urge of like, I, I'm i so, I know I'm adventurous. Like I need to uncover this. And I remember my therapist at the time saying to me, like, I can see it. She could have been lying to me. It was fine, but it was perfect. She's like, I can see in your eyes how adventurous you are. Like, we we need to we need to go there. And I was just like, I mean, she said that, and I remember like getting tingly, like the sensation. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's right. Like, I I have to do this. And you know, I remember I started hiking, and it it wasn't like it solved all my problems, right? But it helped me to actually start to work with those feelings of discomfort in a way that was that felt better than just yeah. doing the things that I was doing routinely just to torture myself. Yeah. So it's like those – I love how you said because it is – and you, you alluded to earlier, right? Doing the things that you value can be incredibly motivating. Yeah. And that's just so, so powerful. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. It's just – I. I, I'm curious because, of course, when you're talking and I know because I'm like in this every day with people, right? They're like, okay, Eliza, this sounds great. Like I'm going to, you know, start allowing fear to talk to me and to tell me like where I need to go and, and what I need to do. But then, of course, the question is, but how do I do it? <laughs> how do I actually get myself – like if you're saying, for instance – if you are really afraid to cross this bridge and this always causes you so much anxiety and you're just telling me, go mm -hmm. cross the bridge and it's yeah. going to like help, you know, yeah. unlock. But, but how do I do that? Yeah. Well, yes. First of all, get a therapist because they will help you. <laughs> like I tell every, I'm like, don't do it alone. Nobody yes. told you to do this alone. We're not supposed to do this stuff alone. So a, a therapist and a good therapist will guide you. I break everything down to the smallest 
level of fear that I can to help people start to face it and realize that they survived. Yeah. I also try to be really strategic. I label every single feeling before and after with a number, zero to a hundred. Where is it going to bring you to cross the bridge? Where is it going to bring you to cross the bridge with your therapist doing it with you, with your cell phone, without your cell phone? So we break it down so we know exactly what it might feel like with your safeties, without your safeties. And then slowly but surely we build up to that confidence. And after every exposure, I tell people, take it in. Take it in what it was like to survive that exposure and to realize that you're still here. And that maybe those fear receptors were misfiring and that it actually was more okay than you thought it could be and build on that so that you know the next time I'm going to do something bigger intellectually I can tell myself it probably will be okay and emotionally it might not feel okay but I'm still going to do the thing and in terms of actually doing it so you get support you plan out your exposures you break it down to the smallest level that you can break it down to and then it's just there are no more rules then you just have to do the thing and you have to go on that first hike and you have to talk to that first stranger and you have to cross that first bridge and you have to go on that first elevator and you have to let yourself experience an increased heart rate while you sit in a chair and stare at the wall without running away from it and checking your heart rate and you have to just do the thing and you're going to feel afraid. And I tell people also, I'm like, if you feel fear, amazing. That means you're doing it right good job. They're like, no, I don't want to feel it. I'm like, you felt it? It's working. If you didn't feel it, it's not working. We need a harder exposure. And I kind of, I create like a different relationship with what it's going to be like to feel fear. I'm like, if you're feeling fear, you're, you got an A plus. You got an A plus in therapy today. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Because I think a lot of people think, right, I'm, I'm setting out to do the exposures and the sort of purpose is to not feel anxious, to not have my body respond, to not feel maybe, oh my goodness, I'm going to have a panic attack. And it's like so much of the recovery is the opposite of, of what you've been thinking and maybe how you've been acting. And it is like, you're going to feel scared. You're you're probably going to feel anxious. You might even have a panic attack. Like then that yep. makes sense. And, yep. and it is a good thing. And I think I'm so glad that you said that because we can often see it as being a bad thing, as being a defeating like I'm I'm obviously not making progress this isn't working this is you know I'm not doing the right things and it's no like it, it's good that you're feeling that and it's helpful yes exactly and and the barometer for like a happy healthy life is not not feeling hard emotions the barometer is when you're living your life in its entirety along with any emotions that have to come for the ride mm. Oh, so good. But but I don't want the hard ones. <laughs> I know, I know that too. Oh my gosh, if I had a magic pill for no hard emotions, Xanax does not count, then I would like, I would give everybody just a little happy pill. We all walk around, no hard emotions. We can do the thing. And it's like, I'm I'm so with you. They're not fun. Yeah. Not sugarcoat it. You can't pretend that they're okay. Like they they're uncomfortable. They are. Yeah. But it's so good looking at that where it leads you to, like, and being able to actually see right after you do the exposure is not just I survived, but like I actually did something that I wanted to do. And I also felt joy and happiness. And those things can also coexist with anxiety. And it wasn't all bad. And like, that's really cool to see because then the more you do that and you feel those other emotions, the more motivating it is to keep doing more things. So it's just as hard as it is, you have to look at this discomfort is actually helping me. It's actually working, like you said, and I love that. So I am just so glad that you came on, Eliza, and shared so much of your wisdom. And I'm just curious, you know, if somebody's in a space right now where they're struggling with panic and agoraphobia and they just feel like, I'm just experiencing so much fear. Like, this is so hard. What would you say to that person? The, the first thing that I tell everybody is really to go back to that self-compassion piece. Because if you have panic and agoraphobia and judgment for yourself, now you're dealing with three hard emotions instead of one, right? Fear. And if fear is there, it's, it, you're, it's able to move. It will move. You're going to get the right support. You're going to do the hard things and it will be okay. You can get yourself to the other side. But if you couple that 
fear with the self-judgment, the self-criticism, the hopelessness, the despair. Why can't I do it? Why haven't I done it? Why did I backslide? Why is it still happening to me? What's wrong with me? That anxiety will get so deeply lodged, it will have a very hard time moving at all. So if the only thing that you do is respond to yourself with love and self-compassion and patience, a part of yourself internally will stop fighting. You will have a lot more energy to do the work that you need to do. So good. All right. If people want to find you, want to connect with you, which I I think they're like, yes, please. Where can people find you? Okay. Before that, Shannon, this was an amazing conversation. It is so inspiring and refreshing to hear somebody at this stage of the journey of healing and Uh being able to reflect on what you've done in this space because it is truly so hard. Like This is such hard work. And to hear that you have had your journey and you've had your moments of inspiration and you've gone on the hikes and you've done the thing and now you're recording a podcast to support others doing the thing is really amazing. So thank you for having me here. Uh, Um, Thank you. Yeah, of course. And so, yeah, if people want to find me, on Instagram, I'm a therapist in NYC. Uh, my website is www.therapyinthecity.org. And my email address is Aliza, A-L-I-Z-A, at therapyinthecity.org. So people are welcome to reach me at any of those places. And I'd love to hear from you guys, learn from you guys, or answer any questions that, that I can. Amazing. And Therapy in the City is just like the best name. Like you have the best name. I love it. <laughs> it sounds so it sounds so cute. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's all there. It's all in the title. It's what we do. Amazing. All right. Thank you, Elisa, again. It's so good to, to speak with you today, Shannon. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Healthy Push. If you want more, head on over to ahealthypush.com for the show notes and lots more tips, tools, and inspiration that will support your recovery. And if you're hoping for me to cover a certain topic, be sure to join my Instagram community at A Healthy Push and let me know in the comments what you want to hear next.